Mesdames et messieurs, dames en heren, Flaget, dat is gewoonlijk een eerder een geluidshuis, maar het is toch ook een huis van het beeld. C'est une maison de l'image aussi. On l'oublie peut-être un peu, mais si en 38 c'était la maison de la première radio, déjà en 38 on était déjà en train d'imaginer les premières émissions télé qui auraient lieu en 1954. Donc c'est une maison où je crois que ce soir on peut dire que on sera la maison de l'image et grâce à ING qui a eu l'incroyable bonne idée, je ne sais même pas si c'est français cette phrase, si c'est du français, mais en tout cas, cette idée absolument riche et enthousiasmante d'inviter un des plus grands artistes de nos temps, de notre monde, ici à Bruxelles, pour montrer une exposition, et j'en je, reviens, et certains d'entre vous en reviennent aussi, une exposition qui s'avère être tout simplement magistrale et absolument magnifique. Mais pour parler d'ING, je crois qu'il n'y a personne de mieux que le directeur général, le CEO d'ING, qui est là ce soir, Eric van den Einde. U bent hier vanavond om ons uit te leggen wat de cultuurpolitiek is van ING en vooral hoe dit prachtige project toch tot stand kon komen. Heel hartelijk dank. Ik wens u hartelijk welkom. U vraagt zich misschien af, wat heeft een bank met kunst te maken? Een bank krijgt immers het geld van degenen die er te veel hebben. Hij leent het uit aan degenen die te weinig hebben. En dat doen we al honderden jaren lang. En dat heeft niets doen veranderen in deze eeuw. Maar bij ING geloven we dat er iets meer is als je bankier bent. We geloven dat in onze bestaansreden... Het echte bankieren, het is van jullie helpen in het realiseren van jullie dromen en van jullie ambities. We geloven dat wij een bestaansreden hebben om jullie te helpen altijd een stap voor te zijn in je leven of in je business. En daarom dat wij graag ook iets met kunst doen, want dat doet kunst ook. Daarom hebben wij in de vorige jaren Guggenheim georganiseerd... Daarom blijven wij heel dicht bij jonge kunstenaars om ze te motiveren om verder te doen. En daarom zorgen we ook voor deze avond met deze fantastische kunstenaars. L'art fait partie intégrale de notre ADN de ING. Dans les années 60, Léon Lambert, baron Léon Lambert, n'a pas choisi la facilité lorsqu'il a dû faire construire un nouveau siège social en contraste avec les maisons de maîtres imposantes du voisinage, il aspirait à créer quelque chose de différent au sein du quartier Trône. Il considérait que cela constituait une opportunité de mener à bien un projet qui contribuerait à leur enrichir l'espace urbain en plein ville de Bruxelles. C'est la raison pour laquelle il a confié à Gordon Bunshaft la tâche de concevoir un bâtiment aux allures modernistes et qui est encore, je dirais, considéré comme un chef-d'œuvre dans ce courant architectural. C'est un bâtiment situé au petit ring de Bruxelles, illuminé la nuit pour une animation de vidéo très moderne. Et il constitue un des, des édifices qui confère sa silhouette à cette magnifique ville. Et dans ce gebouw hebben wij het geluk om met honderden en duizenden mensen te kunnen mogen werken tussen de kunstcollectie van Baron Lambert. Een zeer unieke situatie. En ik ben niet zeker of al onze medewerkers altijd beseffen tussen welke mooie kunst ze werken. Maar het is een van de mooiste plekken, denk ik, in België om kunst en dagelijks leven bij elkaar te brengen. 22 maart 2016. Ik ben zeker dat iedereen in deze zaal nog weet waar... Hij of zij was. De dag van een tragische aanslag in deze stad. Het was een verschrikkelijke gebeurtenis die veel mensen getroffen heeft en die nog altijd veel mensen treft. Het was een dag die veel leed heeft berokkend en ons heeft laten voelen van heel dichtbij hoe kwetsbaar een stad kan zijn. 
Deze dramatische en brutale gebeurtenis heeft ING doen nadenken en heeft ons doen bewegen om initiatieven te starten zoals Sprout in Brussels, maar ook om te gaan zoeken naar iemand die misschien een nieuwe elan kan geven aan deze stad. En we hebben dus toenadering gezocht tot Christo, een kunstenaar, die moet ik u niet voorstellen, maar een kunstenaar die enorm maatschappelijk geëngageerd is en wiens kunstwerken steeds op een zeer positieve impact hadden op een stad waar hij ze ten toon stelt. Dès lors, il nous a paru évident que nous devions faire quelque chose pour cette ville. Nous nous devions de soutenir cette ville meurtrie, de sorte qu'elle puisse recouvrer ses forces. En tant que banque avec son siège social situé à Bruxelles et forte d'une longue expérience en matière d'exposition d'œuvres d'art, nous nous rendons compte, comme nul autre, ce que l'art peut nous apporter. Gelukkig deelde Christo onze bezorgdheid om deze stad en stemde hij ermee in om samen met ons deze expositie uit te werken. En met dit overzicht van zijn werk worden we herinnerd aan de relevantie van een stad in de maatschappij. Aan de belangrijkheid van de monumenten die de stad vormgeven. En aan de schoonheid van die stad wanneer ze vrij is en vol met liefde. Dank je wel. Thank you well, Eric van der Neinde. I have now the great pleasure to introduce Christo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, always uh, when we have a lecture like that, uh, I think what Jean-Claude was saying, and she always was saying that <clears throat> Myself, Jean-Claude, were born the same day, June 13, the same year, 1935, by, by two different mothers. <laughs> I met Jean-Claude in Paris in 1958, and we live in Paris between 58 and 64, and we immigrated to the United States in 1964. Jean-Claude, no, no, we don't immigrate to the United States, we immigrated to New York City, Manhattan. And we live in the same building, in the same place, since 1964. Now, I will be very brief. I will show you images of past project, and of course the future project we're working. And after that, I will willingly answer any question, except I will not talk about politics, religion, is certainly not about other artists. Now, the light. <laughs> I do not read, please, all the light out. All the light out, I basically will tell you images. Now here is a project we did in 1969 called Rap Coast near Sydney, Australia. We Rap Coast Liner who is two and a half kilometer long and have a 85 meter high cliffs to the beach, beach area and use about 30 kilometers of rope and this special polypropyl poly, polypropylene fabric. And 19 1972, we did Valley Curtain, the project in Colorado, Orange Curtain, who was the span of Brooklyn Bridge, and the center is 80 meter high and 160 meter and the main foundation. In 1972, we worked four years to do the project in Running Fence in Northern California and Sonoma Marine County. It's the six, five and a half meter tall fence running for 40 kilometers to Sonoma and Marine County and western extremity of the fence disappearing at Pacific Ocean. Uh, you see that little person there standing to give you the scale, one moment, to the scale the project. And of course, this project again, they stay 14 days, 16 days, and after two weeks of exhibition, all the materials are removed, industrially recycled. In 1978, we did the rap walk, rap walkway in Kansas City, Missouri. We cover four and a half kilometer walkway with this golden fabric and autumn days and actually the fabric, the color of the fabric tried to match the color of the foliage of the tree. In the 1983, after three years, we realized this surrounded Thailand, the project in the Biscayne Bend, Florida, 11 islands and, 11 and 12 kilometer length, and we use a special fabric, actually this is the biggest amount of fabric we use, 
650,000 square meter fabric that is attached to the beach area of the island, flo floating 70 meters on the surface of the water and ending with special octagonal shell boom, an anchor with many marine anchors. And of course, in 1985, after 10 years and two refusal, we wrapped the oldest bridge in Paris with this champagne color fabric in late September, early October, and we have the sunny day, and even the bridge was illuminated, not by us, because historical landmark, the government of France were illuminating the bridges. And in 1992, 21, we finished the umbrella. That is that project take us almost six years to work. We installed 1,340 blue umbrellas in Japan, north of Tokyo, in, about in the state of Ibaraki, and 1,760 yellow umbrellas in Southern California and Los Angeles in Kern County. Each umbrella was six and eight meter high and nine and a half meter diameter. And we have a, a, a umbrella, night umbrella, standing in Sato River in uh, Japan. Now, this is the yellow umbrella who was installed around the Interstate 5 in the Los Angeles and Kern County. And in 1995, we did the project, the RAP rice stack, that we start in 1972. It was refused three times, and finally, in 1995, the project was realized, and we have over five million people come around the rice stack on a beautiful sunny day, end of June, early July. And in 1998, uh, we realized the RAP tree at Berover Park in Fundacion Bailer. We wrap 170 a tree with a special fabric. We have a very different time of season. We have a winter days, you can see it here a picture, and we have a beautiful sunset. And, and in 90, 2005, finally, we did the Gates project from Central Park. That project started in 1979, was refused by the city of New York in 2001, but finally we get the permission and we install 7,503 gates over uh, 27 kilometers of walkway in Central Park. The gates was always six meter high, but the width of the gates would vary with the width of the walkway. We have a sunny day and these gorgeous uh, late days of uh, February, and Jean-Claude always was saying, but also we have a snow. That gives us different dimension of the project in late February. And as you can see, see a section of the, the gates uh, going from the middle of Central Park looking south. You have a, downtown Manhattan and the Empire State Building. And, and then 19, now, we're coming to the period when I did a lot of work with barrels. That is the work, the second public works we realized in Paris in 1962. It was called the Iron Curtain, which blocked the small street and left bank in Paris, Ruiz County, with 100 barrels. And that was the, our Iron Curtain. And I continuously work with barrels. This is a sculpture done in 1964. In the, uh, is a real sculpture, which is in the collection of uh, Institute Marconi now in Italy. And this is how the project for the Mastaba was developing. In the mid 60s we tried to build Mastaba in Texas, because it was very great, better chance to get permission there, between Houston and Galveston. But of course, we failed to get permission. In 1972, we tried to do the project and uh, Holland, in the area near the Kroner Müller Museum, who is one of the biggest collectors of my early works, but we, we failed to get permission. And finally, in 1979, we arrived in Abu Dhabi. And that is a huge structure of 410,000 barrels we like to build. I will show you here, for, for example, to see the, the scale model, who was done in 1979. Give me time, Wolf, a little bit with scroll slide. The structure will be 150 meter high. The vertical wall have 110,000 colors, barrels, and they are 10 different colors. And the, the bottom length of the vertical wall is 300 meter. The slanted wall is 225 meter. Now, that particular uh, shape arrived from the using cylindrical object. When you use cylindrical object, like the bottle, scan, or pencil, or cigarette, or barrels, the angles is always 60 degree. And this is how all the projects start. We like to build, if it's happened, and we hope it will happen, will be the largest, the tallest <laughs> sculpture in the world, and it will stay. Now I will show you that using that photomontage, give you the scale how the project will look. There are no pattern. All these 
10 different colors, but I did it. I remember vividly, like a point a list painting, putting yellow, blue, red, or orange, etc. And now, using that scale model, actually, this is before the scale model. They were Jean Claude and myself collecting sand for the scale model in Abu Dhabi. This is in the late 70s. Here on the site of the project was inland and the beautiful oasis of a line. And here is the Jean Claude last time we were in Abu Dhabi, 2007, before she passed away, actually with Vladimir. Now, here you see the area we like to do the project. It's inland about 100 and 60 kilometers inland with one most beautiful desert which is called the empty quarter near a Saudi Arabian border when they have a high dunes who do not move, they have a vegetation, actually they have a wildlife, the beautiful oak at the white antelopes and that particular site we like to do the project, I will show you here the, the view. But now, one important thing to understand, all this project involves an enormous amount of knowledge that myself and Jean-Claude, we do not have. For each of these projects, we need to hire the right people to help us to build a project. And Jean-Claude have an idea that we should hire the best possible engineering professor of around the world to suggest how to build a project. Now here we're discussing with the professor, assistant of the Federal Institute of Te Technology in Zurich, actually in our home in New York, here we're discussing with the professor and the assistant of the Cambridge University of the United Kingdom to come how they can build the project, how they plan to be built technically, how much will cost, how much how it should be built in some way. And this is for the professor of Champaign, Illinois, of the United States. Now we commissioned this study and we bought these services. Here, for example, you can see us with the professor Sazaki of Jose University in Tokyo. Now, what is the, uh, that myself and Jean-Claude, we're not professional, and we have this four study, cost us about over $150,000, and this study uh, with all the computers and everything, we donated to the very great authority of engineering, Professor Schleich from University of Berlin, to advise us. And Professor Schleich advises us that the scheme of Professor Zazaki is the most innovative that Nothing in the world is built like that. And this is how the project will be built. Basically, Professor Zazaki suggested that we need to flatten the, our geometry of the master bar. Basically, you have two trapezoid walls, two exactly rectangular walls, and a rooftop. And the workers who need to install 410,000 barrels, they will work like a mosaic. They will install working on the floor, installing the, basel, the barrels, but actually you should see, this is not simple, they don't laying in the sand, on the land. They're laying these barrels, they're laying on hundred railroad tracks. And they're like a, they're like a bridge, uh, a, a steel frame that we can elevate it and use that thrust very fast. Actually, in less than two weeks, entire project will be elevated like that. Okay, that is how the project will be built. And from there, we need to now work on ahead to give you the scope of the project. This is the Pyramid of Giza. You see our barrels. This is the, the footprint of the Square Bernini. Actually, without knowing, our project is exactly a little bigger than the footprint of the Bernini Square in the Vatican. And this is the, the Golden Gate Bridge and the, uh, the barrels and the proportion of the height. Now, once we have the concept, our team start to move to orient the barrels, the vertical wall of the barrels with the sunrise and sunset of the sun and that great area inland in Abu Dhabi. And this is the work we did it with a small scale model, the next Wolfie. And give you now uh, exactly the idea to see the scope. This is the site we hope to propose for the Mastaba. You see the flag post, that is the footprint of the Mastaba. Little car is there. I will show you the next color site. This is the height of the Mastaba in the, in the landscape. Now, this is how the project will develop it. But to sensitize the, the Sheikhdom of Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, actually, Federation, we spent three, countless hours of presentation, very much like tonight. We're talking to Women College of University of Sheikh Zayed and Abu Dhabi here. We're talking to the 
brother, the Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince uh, Sheikh Hamdam, who is the responsible for that region. And here I will show you the, uh, one of the more recent drawings of the barrels. Actually, the slanted wall, you have a orange, yellow, and orange, that shape, and going and, to, uh, and uh, 60 degree to the slanted wall. In 1999, in Museum of Germany, in Oberhausen, we installed 13,000 oil, oil barrels, and that special atrium, and you can see they have uh, elevators that you can see from above the barrels. The next, please. And here now, we'll the next. And now, come to the floating piers. Now, you know, some project, we have idea to the, we have the site, like the rice tech project was designed for the rice tech, the, the uh, gates was designed for the central park. Of some project, we have idea, like valley curtain, was idea to hang curtains, and we need to find valley for that, or the running fence, or the umbrellas. And the floating pier was in that category, we have idea in 1970 to make floating pier in the delta of Rio de la Plata in Argentina. We never got anywhere. We have we start to get permission. In 1997, 98, uh, Jean Claude and myself we love to still to that project. We almost did it in Tokyo Bay, where they like to install floating pier, but we never get permission. And now, the 19 1994, I tried to put it there, 2014, when I was became a, uh, 79, I say to Vladimir and Wolfi that I will become 80 and like to do floating pier before I die. This is a little sketch before we looking for the site. And this is why I say, and we need to find water. I, need to, I like to return to Europe. We spend a lot of time in Italy in the, between 58 and 64. I know Northern Italy, they have a lake, so let's try to see these lakes. And also we did project, public project in Italy. We wrap a fountain in Piazza Mercato and Spoleto. We wrap the monument of Vittorio Emanuele in Milano. We wrap the uh, monument for Leonardo da Vinci and the section of Marcus Aurelio Wall in the end of Via Veneto and Villa Borghese, hoping that our um, connection with the Italian a community artist and official can help us to get permission, but we start to scouting for the site of the project. And here the uh, the lakes and the foot of the uh, Alps, and you see the uh, Lake Iseo, who was the most uh, suitable, most exciting because you have an island. Le next, please. Who is the uh, have 2,000 inhabitants? And they have no bridge to go to the mainland, and they go uh, by traghetto, and for 16 days, they can walk in the water. And this is how the project started developing. First, we need to get permission for the president of the lake. Here's the little sketches, the drawings I always did before, using the photograph of Wolfie. First, this is connection from the mainland to the island, and from there, creating that uh, very open dimension and connecting the small island of uh, Sao Paulo framing that island for the floating pier. The important part is the, to approach the people, because everything in the world is owned by somebody. This is the first presentation to Mr. Fakanonik, who is the president of the lake, appointed by the government of Rome, and he helped us to move the project through the two entity, who is the mayor of Sultano. This is the little island of Sao Paulo. The mayor of Sultano, the next, Wolfie. Here is the drawings. I've got a film. The next, please, Wolfie. The next, this is Sultano. This is the mayor of Sultano, Paolo Pizzotti, who was not speaking English, Germano Cilantro, as project director, was translating. And after a half an hour presentation, she say, approvato. Now, we, we're going to take to the mayor of Monte Isola, Fiorello Turla, he also barely speak English, Germano translated, and she so say, approvato. And from there, we try to move to the complexity of how the project will be engineering and uh, realize. You know, we never do the same things again. And it's always important, I say before to some friends here, that we need to do life site tests to learn aesthetically, engineering-wise, how the project will be built. Now, we have this very new engineering way to build float pontoon or floating, actual floating piers. This is invented by the Canadian engineers. And this is a small lake. 
a near Danish German border that nobody can see us. We're performing tests to have the right material, the fabric, and we have the, the, uh, the uh, edge of the uh, floating pier was slanted down to become a beach. That was engineering test, but that was not su sufficient for the permitting process. Here is German Chaland and our engineers we hire uh, to uh, prepare our application to the permission and how the project will be really built. We moved this uh, uh, pier, uh, floating pier from German lake border to the Black Sea in Bulgaria, when the Vladimir, my nephew, had a little house. And now we understand this is the, pier, the floating pier build it, and we have this yellow pole who translate to the computer how the uh, uh, stress of the uh, material is from the weight, and etc. For example, here we have the one ton, 1,000 kilo, and each of these back, how much support the floating pier. All that was done in February of 2050. And to fabricate the project, this is our team in the lake, of, is, to fabricate the project on many occasions, we need to learn that in life size tests. For example, we have sometimes one pier going for 700 meters, suddenly make a curve. We need to find a way to create that angle, degree, who is necessary to be installed during the making of the project. And here I will show you that, that the pier is 16 meters wide, but the two sides, two and a half meters, they sloping down like a beach, who was aesthetically one of the most beautiful parts of the project. And here we are fabricating in four different places, in industry factory in northern Italy, 220,000 cubes who will build the project. This is our, this is what the geometry, they are 50 by 50 centimeter, 40 centimeter high. They have these special ears and pins to be connected that the surface the surface is totally different from normal pantoon. We hire these young Bulgarian workers to work around the clock, actually. Uh, uh, this, we have a most beautiful working site. You know, this is our working site, screwing together all these 220,000 cubes to create it exactly necessary three kilometer of floating pier. Now, but geometric, to have that geometry I designed for the project, we need to install at over 200 anchors deep down in the water. Very important thing I forget to tell you, that lake is not little lake, it's the former glacier. And the distance from the mainland to the islands, the depth of the water is 90 meters. And this is why we need to transport this anchor. In the, these uh, airbags, they, each of these airbags carry five tons of anchor. And when they arrive in the right position, they deflate it. We have uh, this great team of French and Bulgarian uh, deep water divers. They go down there and they connected the anchors with the, the, anch uh, with the surface of the, the floating piers. All that was the enormous amount of material put that you don't see it when you walk in the floating pier. The work was done by the professional gent. You see many of the drawings I do and sell, pay for the project, the next. And, and this is how we can spend it, the payroll going ahead. And this is a nice way to give you an idea how the mainland is down there. Now, during that time, we have a, our working artist on the right side of the picture. From there, we're moving each of these panel section there 100 meters long. We need to have a 30 of them to be installed and created the floating pier. This is how they were moved in the water from there. They are going to the little island of Sao Paulo. They are framing the islands with a very extraordinary maneuver in a cinematically very beautiful, connecting together, and of course connecting that with the deep water anchors underneath. All that was done in very uh, ingenious, very, very simple. We need to transport the, uh, the, the, uh, the sliding uh, 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 bridge for the, from the mainland to go to the, to the island. Now, the fabric, uh, the fabric was not installed directly in the cubes. Before the cubes were installed, felt uh, 10 millimeter over the cubes, and that is felt delivered to, with the helicopter. All the material was delivered by helicopter to the floating pier. We have a 660 uh, non-skilled worker. We start to open the fabric, and that was happened actually in a one and a half day, and this is satellite picture of the uh, project before the people start to walk on June 18. This is just before people start to walk, and now we go ahead 
to see how the project was. Now there, there are three, two and a half kilometer pedestrian street, a small street, was also covered with fabric. The people was walking, was working, uh, uh, going to, on the right side, going in, and the left side, they're going out. <coughs> and we have also special, this is the street and little town of Sotsano. We have a special uh, uh, light uh, to install, fabricated by American company. You see now the beach is coming, this two and a half meter. And what is the one most important things in that project is something only can happen in Italy. There are no parapet. The water is 90 meter depth. <laughs> and you see, but the fabric was always wet and the way, some way the people are starting on the dry fabric, not on the wet fabric. And this is the view, uh, let me go fast, this is a different view of the project. Uh, late on the sunset and now in the evening, we have this special uh, uh, battery actually. They're like a suitcases uh, who bring to the side telescopically. We elevate the light and they, they, they're lit it for the um, nine, ten hours. And, and the next day, we remove the lights and they put the, to be charged again and bring to the side. And this is why the project stay for 16 days from 18th of June and uh, over 1,250,000 people start to walk in the floating piers. It's not working? Not very well. Not working very well, okay. Thank you very much. Now. Now, the, the important part is to have courage to ask questions, but put all the lights. I don't need two lights, only in myself. All the lights in the, in the theater. And have a courage, ask questions, and I would try to understand you, and I would try to answer questions. We're accommodating you. Or okay, have the gentleman there, mademoiselle. Dear Christo, thank you so much for your energetic presentation, full of dynamism. I would like to hear more about how you started, how everything started, the story of the beginning. How I started? Yes, exactly. How you and Jean-Claude started all this great adventure. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple. First, I tell you how I started to be involved with art. You know, I give all that to my parents. My mother and my father saw me very young that I was drawing and they decided that I should have a private lesson uh, instead uh, to play basketball or a musical instrument. After school, I go to real painter, to real sculpture, to start to sculpture, to real architect, to do scale models, and all that things. Basically, since age of seven, eight, I try to be an artist. Now, I study in, Bul I live in, Bul I'm born in Bulgaria, I live in Bulgaria, of course, the Bulgaria art school was extremely co conservative, very much like the style of the Art Bo Academy de Beaux Arts in Germany in the 19th century. You study art or architecture eight years. The, fourth, the first four years, you study everything. Architecture, painter, sculpture, decorative art, even I have a two semester of the section of human bodies. Basically, you study everything. Now, I was born in Bulgaria. My mother is Macedonia, not Greek, Macedonia. My father is half Bulgarian, half Czech. I was visiting my relative in another communist country, Czechoslovakia, when the Hungarian revolution started, and I escaped from Czechoslovakia alone to the West. I was already my fourth year at an art academy in, Bulgar and in Bulgaria. And of course, I do everything possible to go to Paris. I arrived in 1958 in Paris. But the important things you understand that I do things because I'm not yet to know what I am. Meaning that many things look like architecture, many things look like different things. And I, I, I never forget that when we wrapped the Reichstag, the first critic of New York Times was not art critic, was architectural critic. To understand this project, you understand what they are. And if this is why we do this project, they are beyond the normal sculpture, beyond the, they are very much like building airports or highway or bridges. They involve also exactly the same type of workers. They are 
many, many other things. The most important things, I love the real things. Meeting time. I do not know how to drive. I don't like to talk on the telephone. I do not have a stool in my studio. I'm standing. And I don't know how the computer operated. And I like to have the real things. Basically, the real things, the real one kilometer or two kilometers, the real wind, the real wet, the real dry, the real, all the real things. And I'm, I'm almost evil <laughs> of the real things. And this, this project deal with that. But you should understand what is the, uh, how this project they develop. You know, the three-dimensional work of art is very much like that things. Uh, is object and you go around. And if it's big sculpture, it can, like Alexander Calder, can walk inside. But that is the three-dimensional work of art. Pentic is flat surface like that screen and can be abstract or figurative. But this is how the artists, even today, three-dimensional work of art with the television set, their installation, but they're all done by the artist. Artist himself organized the space. Now, what we do with Jean-Claude is something we live all the time, but we're only thinking about it. The moment you walk out from your home, you start to walk on the sidewalk who is designed by somebody. You cross the street, you have a green and red light, somebody conduct you how to do those things. Basically, 24 hours around the clock, you highly live in a regulated space. We never think about that. Airports, street, house, everything is organized with an enormous amount of knowledge of uh, all kind of uh, professional people involving. And what we do with Jean-Claude, we go to that space and we are renting that space, really renting because we pay rent, and we created gentle disturbance for a few days. That basically, we rent the Reichstag, and we rented about almost half a kilometer of the Reichstag to have the Reichstag for ourselves. And, and, and for 14 days, there was the rap Reichstag. I did sketches like an exhibition here about the rap Reichstag. They photographed of Wolfi about the Reichstag. But for 14 days was the Reichstag rap. Basically, the real things. And that cannot be substituted. There was the real water in Biscayne Bay. There was not about the Biscayne Bay, the real water. Basically, the real things, and when we do the real things, we inherit everything was inherent to that place to be part of the work of art. We don't invent the politics in the Reichstag, was in the Reichstag. We don't invent ecology in Biscayne Bay, was in Biscayne Bay. But a very important case is that how much similarity our project involved with architecture, urban planning, to understand this project also deal with a process who is not at all equal to the process of painting in sculpture. Basically, everything in the world is owned by somebody, every square meter. And we technically, we need to have permission to do, to rent it, to pay rent and be responsible. And through that process, is very complex because we never do the same things again. We never do another gates. We never build or up another parliament. We do not know. We need to put together a team to start to negotiate, to work with us in like adventure, to rent the place and realize the project. Now, I often use the word software for that side. That software is that the project do not exist. It exists only in the sketches and the drawings and the scale model. In the mind of thousand people who try to help us, in the mind of thousand people who try to stop us. Meaning that we do not know what is the project. We'll be totally wrong to tell you. In 1972, I know the Reichstag. Reichstag was this rediscovered to us, and this 25 years, what is that? And this is why we're not the commission. This is another story. All these projects, they're related to generate that energy. And some project, for example, there are hundreds and hundreds of documents written, paper, for something do not exist. Ask what artist can tell you that. But, but this is why the project happened. The project developed his own energy, own energy to the software period. The software period is the, that period who can be successful or can be a failure, can be failure, we need to overcome. And the hardware period when we move to the real things. The real kilometer, the real wind, the real sun, the real water, the, all these things. And all that together is the work of art. It's not the for 16 days. And this is why the project exists on that journey to the, all these years. And often, Jean-Claude and myself, we're referring to the project at the time of rap course, to the time of renaissance. We know what year we're talking. 
and they they are part of my life, the slice of my life, and they are something like adventure. And this is why I like to do this project. Basically, it's so invigorating, incredibly uh, uh, dramatic, a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, fear and things going, but it's very exciting. Other question. <laughs> a very, a very small question, please. There is a legend that goes around, Christo here. Ah, here. There is a legend okay. that goes around that you escaped Bulgaria, wrapped into fabric, in the trunk of a car. What is the reality about this legend? No, yeah, the way how you escaped because, Bulgaria. Because uh, no, the, the, not all pro project is the wrappings. You know, the, the, the project, the running fence is not the wrapping, the gates was not wrapping, umbrella was not wrapping. The idea, before to answer the question, understand, but this temporal project, one of the principal elements to translate the nomadic character of the work is the fabric, the cloth. But the cloth is used in many ways, not in the wrapping. It's the different things. But there's some wrap project, like the project and rice tech was the wrapping, the coastline in Australia, upon that. But the wrapping, it's a long tradition in history of art. For a thousand years, the artist used the fabric, not real fabric, was sculpted and painting and drawings and bronze. Actually, can recognize the style of the sculpture and the medieval sculpture, the folds of the fabric was much angular and Bernini or Michelangelo sculpture, Baroque is much from flamboyant. But one of the greatest examples, what the wrapping make in classical art is the case of French sculptor Rodin. Rodin had the commission to do the figure of Balzac, and when the first version of the figure of Balzac, Balzac was totally naked, big belly and skinny legs, and a lot of details, you know. And what he did, Rodin, literally, take the uh, cape of Balzac, put it in liquid plaster, and shroud the figure of Balzac we have now in Boulevard Raspail. Basically, hide all the details, he highlight the principal proportion of figure of Balzac. All the wrapping projects do that. If you're familiar with the Reichstag building, it's the, the Victorian building with other ornaments, decoration. They are all hidden. It suddenly, the architecture of that building became so more readable, so more visible, it's so more uh, exciting, but was different of classical art. All these still pictures, they're not still. Everything moved on this project. I can give you how much the fabric is powerful. We were wrapping the rice stack, and we have a special see-through fence that the Berliner can see the action of rock climber wrapping the rice stack. After that, we removed that see-through working fence, and the people were walking around the rice stack and going to the fabric and push their hands against the fabric. I don't see any people in Brussels walking, touching the buildings. Basically, this is the, the energy of that material. It's a very inviting, very sensual, many, many things involved. And this is something what the project carry for the wrapping. But the gates and uh, the running fence is a completely different story. Other question? Yeah. Somebody? Hello. Where? Ah, sir. So. In the presentation, you didn't mention the project uh, over the river. Is there any reason there? I will, I will explain it. Uh, you know, to do 23 projects, we failed to get permission for 36 projects. Not for the first time we have projects which not happen. Uh, and of course, I do not discuss, there is no time to discuss a not realized project, but it is, is something very important. The sun, some project was refused, and we tried to do it like the rice tech three times, finally we did it. Some project, I will give another example, very funny story could explain it, uh, why the project of over the river is linked to that and 19 and they're very uh, good uh, original works of drawings of that project in 1975 we have idea to wrap the tallest monument of christophe columbus in barcelona and we start to work negotiating the permission and after three years of negotiation the mayor of barcelona was assassinated but not by us he say no he was assassinated now, in 1980, there was another mayor, he also said no, and he also almost escaped the coup d'etat, uh, uh, but not by us. And finally, in 2000, 19, uh, 2000, 1994, 93, 
we received a letter from the famous mayor of Barcelona, Pascual de Maragai, who brought the Olympic Games to Barcelona, tell Christo Jean Claude, telegram, please come to Barcelona. We we'll, I give you permission to wrap the monuments. We don't we don't like to do it anymore. <laughs> you should understand. If we lose the interest to do it, why we should do it? It's my money, it's our money, we like to have pleasure to do it. And if we lost the interest, it's very like artists, abandon the canvas, you go to the next thing. Now with over the real project, it's more complicated. I give you briefly, the project was going to an enormous period of getting permission. The project started during the last year of the Clinton administration, who was very supportive. During the next year, eight years, during Bush junior administration, the project got to the very complicated process and permission. We finally, Obama administration helped us and we get the permission. And when the Obama administration approved the project, the citizen in the valley take to court, sue the government of the United States, why they give us the permission. And the, the project was in the court procedure, from the small court to higher court to higher court, and the project, and, and when we have a new election, I decided that project should not happen. Okay, other question? <laughs> Where are you? Ah, here. Ah, here. The, the microphone, sir. Microphone. So far. No, no, here. No invitation by Brussels City? No, 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 no. It should come. No, I love uh, 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 Belgium, but no, there's no project for Belgium. Other question, please? <laughs> up there, the young lady up there. Uh, there's somebody up there to give? Okay. I don't hear the miss. I'm very sorry. Uh, somebody can repeat the question because I have a slightest idea. Okay, they bring you, miss. They bring you the uh, microphone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello, sorry. Um, it was actually kind of the same question, but going forward on that, because you often create things with a specific location in mind. Do you have something, if you walk around in Brussels, that you would think that you would like to, well, do like an urban intervention here? or a, a specific project that you would like to... No, um, I don't have anything no. in mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, here, the lady. Who's Hello? somebody? The lady, the blonde lady in the middle. Can I ask you a question? Uh, you're there. Right. Where is the microphone? Ah, uh, here. Okay. Here okay. is the mic. Um, I have a question about a particular project. Uh, the one in Oberhausen, the gasometer. Most of your projects are, are very, could be seen from far away. They are very big. They are seen from the space as we've seen with Sultano. They, are, they could be seen from kilometers. But this particular one in, 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 in Oberhausen is inside. It could inside. not be it's seen. It's indoor installation. That is indoor installation. Yes, exactly. Okay. So how, it's very different from the rest. Could you explain? Okay. Who do, could you elaborate? The, the, okay. Uh, the in, uh, of course, the Oberhausen is a completely different project, indoor installation. I do several indoor installations in the museum. Of course, they are not at all like the other public projects. need to go inside, you need to play tickets, or need to go special time. They are totally different. They are not outdoor projects. Uh, other question? <laughs> yes, madam. Hello, Christo. Thank you for all your wonderful work. Um, I just would like to ask you um, why you're doing the Mastaba and it's going to be a permanent. Okay. Um, okay. As opposed okay. to an ephemer no, ephemeral uh, project. I hope you understand, Madame. Uh, I, uh, I do a lot of permanent things. They are smaller sites, but they are permanent because the people buy and their collection, museum have it in their collection. I have a um, barrels and the museum, and uh, uh, Kroller Museum in Holland. I have uh, many uh, uh, sculptures who is permanent, and the master bar will be in that order, will be permanent, permanent structure who can stay. And of course, it's completely different. It's involving maintenance, very much like a, a landmark, like Eiffel Tower. You need to stay and somebody take care about it. That is the decision I have already in the time of 19, 
mid-60s. I hope you understand. I do things like that because also we need to sell to make money to do projects. I sell many permanent things. If you know, they will never be bought and they have dealers and collectors to buy permanent things. Yes, sir. I, no, no, no. I give you my micro driving there. Um, hello. No. Uh, on your left, far on your left. Hello. Good evening. Um, I had a question about the fabric, but you answered. And uh, the other thing I was wondering, and I wonder if I should uh, ask the question because it's an ING night, but I'll dare anyway. Um, why the orange? <laughs> okay, start with the color. <laughs> Very important here, and no, not for the bank. <laughs> no, but you should understand, the colors is something come very late in the, uh, all the studies start with the cloth, ordinary cloth, and very late in each of these projects, the color very late is in, introduced, even uh, is the, uh, start with simple white fabric and the little sketches and drawings. You can see that very well in the case of the Reichstag uh, uh, study here, very early uh, drawings and collages actually of the Reichstag I used white fabric, uh, uh, who was really, the color was not yet. And the color is always something come much later through the knowing the side, the light, many, many things. And you cannot impose that color because you like to have orange or yellow and blue. And each of these projects is related to that. And the, the color really technically, in the very end, come with the life size says, never before, because you cannot choose the colors in the studio. You need to choose it outside in the, very, the, the real light and the real uh, form. Now, it's not blue, not yellow, because I use blue and yellow and orange and silver, many different colors. In the case of the umbrellas, who was really very important part, because the umbrellas was like a classical painting and two part, you know, two painting make diptych, and the project of the umbrella was diptych, involving the two richest country in the world that time, United States and Japan, we have many similarities, many differences. And this is why we chose the west coast of the United States, which is tilted to Pacific Rim, not the east coast. And we use the landscape in Southern California, which is dramatically different from the landscape in Japan in the, uh, in the autumn days, when we like to do a project with full of water, very green. And all that was part. This is why for the project and, uh, and, and the umbrellas, we have life size umbrella, with different hue of yellow, a different hue of blue, all kind of blue, built, installed on the site of the project, see them from far away how they look, see them how they, uh, they when they are wet by the rain, and choose the right blue, the right yellow. That is the question. Yellow was dry, because the landscape is, is, was dry, and the blue was wet. In the project of the gates, again, the gates, you can see that very well in the drawings and the study in the today exhibition in the, uh, in the, here in Brussels, that they are the very early sketches, very beige ochre color, warm color, because by principle the project was tended to be, slated to be in the winter time, because we like to do the project when the tree have no leaves, they're leafless. During the summertime, Central Park is like a forest. This is why, and that gray, very uh, gray silver color of the branches of the tree, we try to introduce some warmer color. And from that very beige yellow, who is the first drawings, we come to the very saturated, not orange, it's called saffron. Saffron color, who we use for the project. But again, I, like I tell you, that is the process come from the life science test and many, many things. Each of these projects developing. The same thing is for the, the, for the Pont Neuf, for Pont, Pont Neuf project is not yellow actually, is the like a straw color, or Jean-Claude loved to say, the color of the stone of Ile de France. Uh, of the, this is that, 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 that actually from far away, when the pond was wrapped, you cannot see this wrap. It's a, um, mil, uh, put together with the landscape of the, uh, the urban scape of Paris, and it was looking like a stone, beige stone, but only when approaching, you see the pond was wrapped. You know, all this is part of the aesthetic decision. Okay. Directly. Uh, okay. The loud. The I think it, uh, no, no, no. 
You, you start in the late 60s with John Calder in Australia, and he designed the... Yeah, you start with the wrapping coast, and then after you... Okay, <laughs> okay, and this uh, John Culler is a is a designer of of uh, fabric. For me, it's very interesting. All the fabric, very marvelous, very fine and and uh, fine material. I have all the material from your project. Who designed your material? You and uh, Culler. No, no, no. I can tell you, John Culler is a big collector of mine, and is uh, producing the is involved with the clotting fabric. We cannot use clotting fabric. All this project they done with industrial textile have nothing to do with the clothing fabric. The industrial textile, well, all the fabric is fab come from a petrochemical industry, is dacron, nylon, uh, polypropylene, all kinds of things. And they, uh, you, they're a much bigger industry for the construction purposes, environmental purposes, many things. For example, the fabric we use in the Australia coast was not really uh, woven fabric, actually were mesh who was woven, and it's called erosion control mesh. That fabric is done for the farmers in uh, South Pacific area in the, in, uh, in the uh, all the Australia and you know, the China, Indonesia, because they need to cover the good earth when put a crop, and that the crop can grow from the, through the fabric, and the typhoons and hurricanes do not remove the good earth. And this is what the fabric we use. It's called erosion control mesh. And that is the, why the fabric was so suitable for the project. And when it was removed, we sell the fabric to the farmers to use it for that purposes. Now, each of these projects, the fabric is very complex, but that is the less expensive part, the less difficult part, because you need to find company who are willing to go ahead to make research for you. I can tell you many stories why the fabric of all the projects now be done in Germany, because only the German textile company like to go to the effort for our project, but they are not won the project. The most expensive part in the project is the labor. The labor, the pay, the workforce, that is tremendous to give you the cost of the labor for one day exhibition of the uh, Umbrellas project in Japan, in California. The payroll was over half a million dollars a day. Hi, I, I, I Christo. Yeah, who is that? I've got a... Where? Yeah. Okay, okay so... Uh, I've got a question on the mass about uh, why, why this project hasn't been approved yet, and why, what are the key challenges you've got today? Why the project is not approved? No, yeah, not approved yet. Oh, and, there are many reasons, you know, they, that we do the very poor job to convince the people. We are confronted with the impossible change in the mind of the people. You know, you understand that I said before, everything in the world is owned by somebody. I need to talk, to talk to these people, convince them. And I always taking the case of the rice stack, you know. There was very simple uh, arithmetic. The rice stack is owned by the German nation. Basically, around 80 million Germans, we cannot talk to 80 million Germans. Fortunately, they are represented by 590 German uh, elected officials in the rice stack. And this has come to simple mathematics. We need to talk on every of them to see us, to give us half an hour or 15 minutes, or sometimes refuse to see us, to convince him why I like to wrap the rice stack. And I have only very few minutes to talk to that. Uh, we usually start early in the morning. Uh, we have this meeting in Bonn, then the capital of Germany. I have three, three things to tell that I believe will be beautiful, that I show himself project realized. I believe uh, we pay with our money, and that all the materials we recycle. This is the three points I have to explain in a matter of 15 minutes, probably a um, little more time. Some, some of the deputies refuse to see me, but some deputies say, I will vote for you, but you should come to my constituency, my village where I'm elected, to explain why I should vote for you. And this is, we spend countless hours talking to the, far, to the people, ordinary butcher, uh, uh, storm owners, uh, uh, organize meetings in the schools for children that they talk to their parents. I cannot tell you, I don't speak German. We have uh, Wolfie <laughs> who was translating, another translator. But this is the thing. 
But the biggest example to give you the case in Japan, in California. You know, in the, to give an example how it's difficult, sometimes almost impossible, but need to go through that. In the uh, 19, uh, uh, I put it kilometers, miles now, and 19 kilometers length in uh, Japan, we have 416 Japanese rice, rice field farmer. And, and, and if, uh, 14 kilometers, 15 kilometers length in California, we have only 26 cowboy ranchers. Now, we have a hell of a time to convince the cowboy rancher. But the Japanese rice field farmer is not difficult, except Jean Claude say, we need probably to drink about 6,000 cups of green tea <laughs> to convince them. But we were not speaking Japanese. We have a great translator who, after several days, they know what we're saying, and they were saying right away what we're saying. No, but we have a terrible time with the government of Japan, the central government of Japan. It was absolutely horror story. And contrary, in California, we have a very good time with the state of California, the county, and the federal government in Washington. There was two things. But they tell you, there no explanation. There are 100 vignette story of, of that project to say the similarity differences. We need to hire near 2,000 workers for the umbrellas in Japan and California. And all, we try to hire them, young people, and uh, university and uh, gymnasium, we are talking to the final installation of the umbrellas. And I remember vividly when we talked to the college in uh, Los Angeles after the presentation like that, first question, how much we cost or who pay for that? We're flying to Tokyo, when we stay in Tokyo, we're talking the same group of young people, the first question, why blue, why yellow? <laughs> we see the difference, it's already there. Already there, all the project was like that. No. And this is why they, this project they are so stimulating because they are so invigorating, it's so uh, rich for anything we do. So Other question? What, what do you need to do in Abu Dhabi to convince them to, uh, to, to oh, go to the who, end? Who, where, is the, who, Peter, who the, where is that man? Yeah. Ah, here, sir. Okay. Important thing is that myself or Jean-Claude or Tim or other friends, we're not the people who only talk. We need to create a team, team to approach us, to approach the people other side. I'm nobody for many people. Don't, many people don't care about art. It's not necessary. And this is why for all our projects, we need to find lawyers, the specialists, who can talk on behalf of us, or also, but we pay them, they work in city. Now, in the United States, probably around the world also, is not very much when the President of the United States retire, and some of the top ministers of the United States, they are people who met everybody around the world. They know everybody around the world, and they created their own company. And that company gives the services of, in the industry, and in the merchant, and many things. And that company gives the services all for us. The principal person, is not secret, who do the, our talking organization of that project, is former Minister des Affaires étrangères, Foreign Secretary of Mr. Clinton, Mrs. Madeleine Albright. Mrs. Madeleine Albright is principal to directing the, all the meetings and all the talking of our project, and of course her company have a team of advisors, a former national security advisor, actually uh, uh, Sa Sandy Berger, who passed away, was very much involved with that project. Anyway, each of these projects have team like that who work for us. It costs a lot of money. Good evening. Yeah. Other question? On this side, yes. Good evening. Where? Here. Ah, here. On your left. Ah, there. Thank, okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, you told us that most of your project take a very long time to be achieved. And uh, once they are realized, they don't last. Uh, they are short-lived. So my question is, what is your relationship and your sensitivity to the question of time, of memory? And do you think that beauty shouldn't last for you to exist? But, you, know, you know, this project, they design that they cannot stay and they cannot exist because they're totally irrational. Absolutely no reason to exist. This project exists only because I like to have them, some friends like to have them with me. They're not justifying to exist. They do not 
the, the world can live without running fence and valley curtain. Who cares about that? But they are very necessary for me. And this is why their project is absolutely presence of freedom. And the freedom is the enemy of possession. Because possession is equal of permanence. This is why this project cannot exist. They exist only for this brief time, a once in a lifetime, and never again. And this is why we love this project. They are so incredibly unique. And they are, I say before, they are a slice of my life, and the life of Jean-Claude, the life of some friends, and is gone forever. I have here. one more Why? question up here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> On the second balcony. In uh, that sense, I wonder to what point do you regard your permanent works as artworks or as commodities? No, they, they are all, all works of art themselves. Okay. They are like a drawings and sketches and sculpture like legitimate works of art. They are commodity like anything artists do with their hands and sell and valuable and they exchange, etc. Like drawings and sketches and scale model I have some sculpture there like any works of art you have in museum and collection, everybody. This is the legitimate commodity, yes. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I, I'm curious about two things. I'm on the second balcony. Where, where are you? I cannot... Up, up. Up there. Okay, madame. Okay. Okay. Just okay. Two things I'm curious about. Uh, one is why barrels? And if, why the barrels? The oil barrels? Uh, why a, barrels? Yeah. And why the second is, um, do you take more joy from the process of planning or from seeing your realized works? They, I say before, the software period and the hardware period, they're bound together. They're bound together. Uh, certainly, at the very end, we like to see the real things. You know, the real thing is impossible to imagine because it's never been done before. You hope you understand. This is the very exciting, uh, the perfect example with the floating pier. We, we, we was not even capable to imagine how the project will look. Even we do life size tests, we do a lot of research, but they were impossible to imagine the magnitude of that very a unique relation of humans with water, etc. is impossible. This is why we like to, to, to realize, and it's not only idea, it's very part of the excitement to do that project. I forget the last thing, question. what is the other question? The, I forget the... <laughs> what? <laughs> Bar the barrels, okay. The, bar the barrels come, of oh, well, course, the barrels come to very simple things. You know, uh, you're not familiar, but I, I start like any normal sculpture to do small pieces, wrap bottles, wrap tin cans, little round tin cans, at home, like what they call inventory, like you're moving from your house and put things in the corner of the room, and there are these small sculpture. If from the little tin cans wrapped, come to the small size barrels, after that the big barrels. And their sculpture, late 50 done, with some barrels wrapped, is some not wrapped barrels. They're wrapped with fabric and lacquer, and play, because the barrels was very banal, cylindrical object, exist, and was transformed with the fabric, and of course the industrial color of bar barrels, you know, ready-made color for product of barrels transport, was all part of that sensitivity that I like to use, not special, material. But the same things, the magic of the barrels is that when you stack them together, they create form. And of course, the master bar is not simple form, is the, is the proportion who I work very, we work very hard to arrive that proportion, who is the two, three, four. And is the absolutely not related to the pyramid, is much older form. The master bar come from the first urban civilization who was a country called Mesopotamia, today Iraq, with in the front of mud houses, they build benches of mud, who have a two slanted wall, trunk at top and two vertical sides, the people to sit on the bench. And that is called mastaba, even an area of Abu Dhabi, the old people, Bedouin, call this type of structure like mastaba. But that particular form can be created by stacking oil barrels. And of course, the, the magnitude of, of the proportion, two, three, four, come to that we only we discover how it's incredibly uh, different is that when you move around the sculpture, when we move around the slatting wall of the sculpture, 
of the mas our mastaba is only the wall go up it will be 500 feet or uh, uh, 500 no more uh, uh, near 350 meter tall stairway you don't see anything left or right except rectangular form of the balance and when you move from that rectangular form to the vertical form the entire structure look like <gasps> is coming out of that. And you don't have that in the pyramid, you don't have anything, and that vertical of wall. And when you front, front a vertical wall, it's like a most incredible mosaic, because the barrels, they're not like bricks, they're offset in, out with the rings. And it's not like a brick, brick wall. And it's like something, uh, of course, you cannot even imagine what would be 150 meter high. This is why the beauty of the, and this is why we try to orient the sides of the project with the, with the sunlight because it's the cap, uh, uh, topic of the cancer is there. That in the middle of the day and summertime, there are no shadow. Uh, uh, Why are you? I'm here. Ah, here. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you mentioned before that uh, from the moment we leave our home, everything is ordered. The built environment is full of order. Everything is designed, it's very neat. Uh, and then when I look at your work, at the umbrellas, it's disturbed the landscape, but it unifies the landscape. When I, I look don't understand at how to work with the umbrellas. With the umbrella, yes. the element, it's an artifact. You spread it on the landscape, you yeah. disturb the landscape, but you unify the landscape at the same time with the unified yeah. umbrella. Yeah. And then when you uh, make the largest scale projects with the fabrics, very uh, sensible way, you create it through a larger a large scale through the city and connect different places. Is this your way to break through the order and maybe to connect no. what's not connected? It's not, no, we play with the order, not break through the order. And I give you an idea why do we do the umbrellas. Because this is exactly, the umbrellas come not like that because the Chinese like umbrellas. Actually, the umbrella was not invented in China, it was invented in a country that so old, like Mesopotamia, there was invented the umbrella, not by Chinese, not by Japanese. But the project was like that, right? Because the project was involving three-dimensional work of art with differences in the United States and Japan. Basically, the space. The space uh, is the, uh, the, we, the humans, build their houses in that space. And that space, there are so many houses. In the beginning, we tried to think to build houses before the umbrella. Was it was too complicated because we be logistic. Before, after the umbrella was the tent, but again, it was too complicated. Finally, we built this two-story umbrella, who is the house without walls, like a roof of the house to create that situation. And actually, the entire project is built like a house. The umbrella was near the gas station, near the church, near the temple, near the marketplace, in the, in the everyday life in the people in, in uh, Japan and California. To give you an idea the magnitude how was, why there were so much more landowners that California have a 30 million, 36 million people at that time, is almost the site of Japan. Japan is almost the size of California. We have 120 million people, meaning that the space is so rare, so complicated. And these 120 million people live on only an 8% in, in the space of Japan because other 92% is volcanic mountains. Basically, every square meter is controlled, used by so many people. It's very restricted. It's so many people use that space. And this is why we decided to build the houses and very controlled space, like a California, like Japan. You build the houses and very open space like California. You see the very much the way how the project, this umbrella was situated. Umbrellas in California was spreading in all directions, left and right. Inter, there was always principal road, interstate five in California. There was principal road in Japan, three county. An umbrella was spreading, but there was no room to spreading. Sometime, in the in the in one rice field, we can put up barely one umbrellas because there's so much forest and things available. And this is why the project was designed that way. The people, and of course, that there much more geometry involving in Japan, the way how the people, uh, uh, the people living, the farmers use the land, very geometric against the very open 
land and California going all directions. All that was the part how the structure was installed and this surveying and design how these umbrellas was installed on these two sides simultaneously. And actually the two sides was very close to the big metropolis. The umbrella Japan side was 40 kilometers of Narita International Airport and the, the uh, California side was only about 80 kilometers 80 km from Los Angeles International Airport. Basically, they were very accessible to go to see the project. All that was part of the decision to create that project in this space. The young lady there. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes. This lady. Allow me a very down-to-earth question. I have understood that the people who work with you are not working for free, unfortunately. So how do you finance your projects? What are the revenues? How do you do that? Okay. Uh, this is a good question. <laughs> very expensive question, but it's very good. You know, to be the, I don't know how much time, but very fast. You know, I, I am... Uh, I am Artist, I'm 82 years old, and I do all the original works with my own hands. I do not have assistance. I have studio on the fifth floor in an old industrial building built in the 19th century downtown Manhattan, and I do all the drawings, little drawings, scale modeled myself. They're works of art independently, scale modeled drawings, collages, etc. And, and these works have the value, and we try to sell them. We sell them to dealers, collectors, museums around the world. And you can see very much this exhibition here is a perfect example how, how many drawings I do, and some, if the project takes a long time, like the longest project with three refusal, the rice stack, I did, I did over 650 original works in 25 years, from four different scale models to the also variety of sketches, drawings, and collages, etc. We sell these original works to collectors, museum, and the money comes. But the project is not paid only by the drawings of that project. The project is paid by everything we, we know, we own. And because in the early years of us, we never have exclusive relation with galleries, like galleries take exclusivity with your work, we find ourselves to be the biggest collector of our work. And to put it on site, logistically, this project, they're not normally financed that you're thinking by artists. Many years ago, in the time of the uh, rap course in Australia, our, our principal lawyer in Chicago, California, suggested that we need to build, we need to create a corporation, non-non-profit corporation who pay taxes, who will be holding company, and they're a corporation called CVG Corporation, my initial, Christopher Limov Fevashev, is the uh, New York City Corporation and Delaware Corporation in the United States. That corporation was created to build our project, to sell our original work of art, and to buy back our original works of art. We're continuously buying and secondary market works of mine that we can sell more expensive later to somebody else. Now, and this is the corporation who really make the money. And when, that when we build project in Germany, there was the Rapp Reister Corporation subsidiary of the CVG Corporation, who was only paying the bills in Germany to fabricate the project. There was the a floating peer corporation, still exists in Italy, who only was created Italian corporation to pay the bills of that project. Now, some of you artists, you know very well that the collectors, the dealers, uh, some museum, they are notoriously slow payers. They, are share, they buy the work, but they pay an installment the work, little by little, and we cannot say to our workers, we cannot pay you because Mr. Smith, who bought the work, he don't pay yet. This is why when we do the project ahead, we try to work with banks. I'm educated Marxist in Bulgaria. I work with banks, banks, and we try to secure a line of credit with banks. It's not secret. We have a we work with the uh, Citibank, we, we work with the Neflis Bank, we work with the uh, Julius Baer Bank, with Bank of Liechtenstein, Deutsche Bank, and recently we worked Credit Suisse. Now, because we are the biggest collector of work, our principal storage is in Basel, Switzerland. And that is the, the line of credit can be secure of banks who believe that my work is valuable, Basel, Switzerland. And this is how it's happened. Now, to know more about that, in 2005, after the Gates project, we received a call from Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School 
teach by cases. There is a case of Steve Jobs, there is a case of Bill Gates, and there is a case of Christopher Jean Claude, how they pay for their project. It can click, you need to pay, I think, $30. It can have 35, 40 page study. They talk with our bankers, they talk to ta ta ta, everything. We were present in the case and the school explaining. And this is a simple thing simple use of capitalist STEM resources to do the project. Um, Mr. Christo, I think you're one of the greatest artists of our time. I had this experience. I have this to make this introduction because me and my family, we had one of the greatest uh, aesthetical and philosophical experiences of our life in, uh, when we were at the Floating Piers. Uh, it was a sort of enlightenment for us. And now I have an odd question, because it's, you took it all away uh, after 14 days. 16, 16 days, sorry. <laughs> and now I wonder, um, just for my future grand-grandchildren, would it be at any time possible that some of this great work of you, yours would be, say, in 100 years, would be a re no, not remembered, made again. Did you have some leftovers to show to have the same experience you have to have, you, you have to have to experience your work live? Not, of course, the, the drawings are, are beautiful, but you have to experience this alive. That's what I meant. Uh, but this is, I say before, <laughs> I, love this, question. I love this physical experience and it cannot be uh, uh, preserved because it's happened at a particular time of our life and that cannot be preserved. 100 years or 40, for 200 years will be different. We'll be different people. This is why uh, I never think that to be reinstalled again, even there are some people thinking about that, but cannot be done. But this is why, through the making of the project, we, I put aside a number of original drawings and sketches of that project. Where the project is removed, we very consciously collecting components of the project, real ropes, real fabric, anchors, ta ta ta, -ta many things, all the archive of the project, all the documents. In each of our big projects, we have own documentation exhibition. There are huge exhibition between 300 over 500 items. We use often this exhibition to sensitize place where we like to do new projects. For example, when they try to get permission for the Reister project, when Bonn was capital of Germany, point of documentation exhibition, not one thing, the huge who we own, was exhibited at the museum in Bonn to explain to the politician how urban uh, European project was realized to make analogy to help us to get permission. But the very important part is also that I myself with Jean-Claude and our friends, they know that all this archive should stay together because at least that the people have of this project. This is why before Jean-Claude passed away, she worked very hard, and now the archives, all that documentation, exhibition of Ferenc Fence was bought by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, who owns all the museum, their own the Ferenc Fence documentation exhibition. We succeeded to sell to the German Foundation also, and they donated, landed for long years to the German Foundation who bought the Reichstag documentation exhibition. And today, Reichstag documentation, documentation exhibition for near 300 pieces is in the Reichstag on the second floor. You can see all the story, the photograph, the film, etc., how the Reichstag was done. We like to do that with all the projects, like the, the pony of documentation exhibition, the gates, the, the islands around the island, all these umbrellas. And one of the things I need to do before I passed away and or our foundation tried to do to find home for this exhibition. But also they help us to do new projects. For example, we sell the Reichstag documentation exhibition. There was a very important push to have money to do the floating period project. You know, there are all these things, but we cannot substitute the time. It cannot be back in 1960 or 19. This is a beautiful story. Their films and photographs, and they, but this is the beauty of this project. They're once in a lifetime and never again. 
Okay. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Dear, This is the last question. Dear Cristo and ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for this incredible presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.